Well, Al, like I said, our mentor retreat there was saying it was just amazing. Paul Johansson is just a, a God sent, you know, and his word is just, you know, just right on time. You know, and there's so much that was in that retreat. It was, uh, the theme of it was uh, prisoners of purpose, you know, and it was just amazing. But one of the things that I just want to quickly share was that, uh, you know, he, how God uses people from dysfunctional homes, you know. Because I come from a dysfunctional home, you know, and he can take people from dysfunctional homes and their series life as it progresses will surrender to God. And even when they're not surrendered, God still can use them until they come to that place and, and do some amazing things because God has a purpose. Amen? Amen. You know, it's amazing how God works in us. But today I want to be real because we've been... And I was listening, have you guys listened to the news lately? You know, all the, all the junk that's out there. I mean, I, I was sad and every time I hear about, the, and this is in no way a judgment, but Bill Cosby, you know, because I, I grew up with Bill Cosby as a kid, you know, and, and all his shows were so wholesome, you know, they were so pure, you know, and I'm wondering like, wow, you know, and, you know no, and it's not that, we're, we're perfect, but you know, you know, God, God has a way of, of working things out. We can't hide if we're dealing with stuff. You know that, right? Turn to somebody and say, you can't hide from your sin. The Bible says it'll find you out. So we, we got to be real, folks. And I, I, I like the idea of being practical. You know, I, I, you know we've been working on a series, as you know, uh, the keys to a blessed life. You know, God blesses you know, wants to bless us. He wants us to fulfill our our purpose. And I want to do something a little, no, it's not different because I like the idea of being creative, but uh, I want you to listen to this scripture verse in Matthew 5, 8. Then I'm going to ask you to do something. I've shared this many times of what was happening when Jesus met these people at that mountaintop. It says that God it says God blesses. Jesus turns to them and says, God blesses those whose hearts are pure, for they will see God. When you hear they will see God, what, what do you think you hear? But the phrase right before it says, God blesses those whose hearts are pure. Now when you think of pure, you want to think perfect. Right? That's the first thing that comes to mind when you hear pure. How many, how many hear perfect when you hear pure? But I want you to do something. I want you to the person right next to you. Now remember, Jesus was talking to the people that were following him. We know a little history about the people that were following him, right? They were just not in all in the right place. You know, a lot of them were just seeking him because naturally we seek the one who will heal us. We look to people that can help us. So they were coming to Jesus because he can heal them. He can help them in their circumstances and trial. And some of them didn't even know why they were following. They were probably following the crowd. But he turns to them and he tells them, you know, if you're going to follow me, he tells them the instructions. You, you know the Beatitudes there. He was telling them. In this particular instance, he tells them, bless the pure in heart, for they will see God. Now what I want you to do is this. I want you to turn to someone next to you and think about this a minute. If Jesus turned to you, because he was talking to you and I, he was talking to you and I turned to someone, he was talking to you too. When he was in that mountaintop talking to those people who was following him, are you following him? Are you even seeking him? Because if you are, then he's talking to you too. That's the reality. So he turns to you and says, Bless of the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Now turn to the person next to you and what tell them what you think God is Jesus was saying to you. <laughs> think about it a minute. What was Jesus telling you? Tell the person next to you.
Okay, I want you to hold your thoughts one minute. I know you're not finished. But I want to read a different version of that particular phrase in the message. It says, Jesus says, blessed, happily, and, and viably fortunate, and spiritually prosperous, possessing the happiness produced by the experience of God's favor, and especially conditioned by the revelation of His grace, regardless of their outward condition, are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. How elaborate is that? Huh? So, let me hear. What is Jesus telling you is pure in heart? Anybody? Not rhetorical. What do you think is he telling you? Uh, without ulterior motives, like in order always to get something from him, but to seek him, you know, with just to know. Okay, good. Yes? What motivates you? Okay. I would say the honest hearing. Honest, okay, very good. Yeah, uh, being honest and like really uh, exposing what you're really thinking. when I bring these questions up because it makes you think, right? Mm -hmm. But it doesn't mean perfect. And in no way does it mean you need to be perfect. And I, as I started to think about this, uh, you know, our culture is obsessed with, again, you know, appearance, beauty, intelligence, success, but God cares about what is inside, not about wealth and accomplishment. In fact, God cares more about our hearts than He does our sin. Turn to someone and say, He cares more about our heart than He does our sin. God blesses people who have a pure heart of integrity. <coughs> Honesty was a powerful word. Integrity. Because there are stories I'm going to read today that, as a matter of fact, we need to be out here today by 2.30 because they have a group coming in, so I gotta make sure I, I can't read too much. But I wanna get to the point. But, that is a, uh, but it does not mean having a reputation. It says this, that, that matches your, it says having a, a reputation that matches your private life, basically. Because God knows what's going on in your life. It doesn't mean sinless, folks. Well, turn to someone, it doesn't mean sinless. It doesn't We walk about several of God's blessings is uh, integrity. And several ways of living and developing more and in our lives is about being honest and direct. Now, I want to read something in Hebrews 12, 14 before I start telling you some stories. Uh, in Hebrews 12, 14, it says this. And the, again, I was reading the message this time, and it says in verse, I started in verse 12. And it says, it says, so don't sit around on your hands, no more dragging your feet. Clear the path for long-distance runners so that uh, one will trip or will not trip. He says, he says, clear the path for long distance runners so no one will trip and fall. So no one will uh, step in a hole or sprain their ankle. He said, help each other out and run for it. He says, work at getting along with each other and with God. Otherwise, you'll never get so much as a, of a glimpse of God. He says, make sure no one gets left out of God's generosity. He says, keep sharp eye 
how for weeds of bitter discontent. Thistles or those two gone seeds that are ruined the whole gone. He said, be careful with all of that. He said, watch out for the Esau syndrome. What's the Esau syndrome? You ever had an idea what the Esau syndrome is? Remember the Esau syndrome? Yeah, it's my right. Give up your rights. See? Give up your rights, yes. He didn't value. He didn't value his blessings. He didn't value his gifts. He didn't, he didn't see that as nothing. He rejected God, basically. And so the Esau syndrome is trading away God's lifelong gifts in order to satisfy your short-term appetite. And so often that's what we settle for. The immediate things that I have now, what I want now. This is one point. I want to be successful now, then I'll serve God later. That used to be my thing way back in the day. I used to say to myself, to the Lord, I'll serve God, you know, when I get old. That's what I used to say. You know? But right now, it's all about me. But God doesn't give you the opportunity to wait till you get old. You will know how Esau later regretted his his impulsive act and wanted the blessings afterwards. But by that time, it's too late. And so often we want that. But in Hebrews, Paul is talking about be careful with the ceremonial cleaning rituals that we uh, that prepare them for worship. Because back then in the history where they used to get it, they had two extremes here. We have those who, you know, just you know throw out our blessings, don't really care. We have those who are really, really religious. That we put so much emphasis in our gifts and our blessings and all things we have, and we worship those things. Ceremonial religious leaders, they, they had it down to a science, but they had no relationship with God whatsoever. They did all the cleansing, all the stuff to get closer to God in the temple. But here, God's telling us that sin, the only thing that sin does to us at this point, it, it sort of blocks us our vision for God. Sin blocks our vision for God. God sees the heart because He knows your intent. What I'm trying to say here is that so often we want to follow some sort of ritual to try to attain God's blessings. And it's not a ritual that He's looking for. Psalm 1089 tells us that the integrity of the honest keeps them, keeps them on track. He says the integrity of the honest keeps them on track. That means those that are honest with themselves and know the junk. You heard Jerry Jay say it today. People who just humble themselves and say it. So if we want to see God, we must renounce sin and acknowledge it and so we can get in a better place. So as I started to study this and get into the word of finding out, you know, and, and as Paul was saying in, in Hebrews, he said, let your uh, character or moral disposition be free from love of money, from lust, from the cravings of earthly possessions, and be satisfied with your present circumstances. Yes. To be satisfied with what God is doing in your life right now, and with what you have. For it is God Himself has said, I will in, in, in no way fail you, or give, up, give, give you up, nor forsake you. God's promise to you is these things. But he's turning to you as Jesus turned. He says to you, I need you to understand that I'm looking for a pure heart. It's the only way you're going to see God. We are working out our salvation as we know. Hebrews 4 tells us, living by faith is far better than merely fulfilling rituals. We can come to church every Sunday and think we, we, we've done that. But he, God's looking for obedience. Now, we know that God is not just a, a disciplinary parent. He's also a demanding coach. He puts these things straight out there. Jesus didn't hold back, did he? Have you ever heard Jesus hold back? He told Peter this, he told the Pharisees that. He was very straightforward and direct. What I need you to hear today is what God is saying to us here. When we encounter a life of transitional moments like, you know, things that life comes with my children, with a house, with a new job, with this and all of that. When we experience these things, it's so, easy, it's so easy for us to get caught up in it because it's the immediate. And God's saying, I need you to put some focus. He said, honest people can always feel secure, but lying cheaters 
would always get caught. See, God knows what's in your heart and in your mind. You can't lie to Him. And He wants us to be honest and pure. Although we may not feel strong enough to push to the victory, God says that He will give us the strength to accomplish it. Psalm, write this, 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 this uh, verse down. Psalm 5.5 5 tells us, As we grow spiritually, our sensitivity to sin increases. As we grow spiritually. Meaning that as we develop our spiritual man, we start to grow and develop and our sensitive and know when we're sinning, when we're going to fall, what's coming, and we know to, to know those things. This is what God said when we develop spiritually. But it says that we must not live with only our own survival mind. And that's one thing that I want to talk to you about today. I want to talk to you about a little my background growing up because it, it sort of makes sense here. Growing up, I, I, I remember uh, how God has orchestrated my life. Today, I can look back and see the orchestration. I was in a, uh, there's two stories that I'm gonna tell, I'm trying to find out which one I'll tell you first. Well, let's put it this way. I was in gangs when I was young. When I was in gangs, and during that period of time, every neighborhood had, had a gang with the colors and all of that stuff. It was a territorial thing, you know. I was the type of guy that I was a survivor, so I had to be a part of the gang. Matter of fact, I was part of a vice president of the gang. We were the younger version of the adult gangs because even the younger people wanted to follow the older people. So we had younger gangs. So I'm over here, the vice president of a gang, and every gang has um, a rituals. Do you know what those rituals are? You have to go through what? Initiations. If you wanted to join the gangs. And so I remember clearly the initiation. And then sometimes those things were brutal and cruel. I didn't have a brutal, cruel heart. To be a president of a, or a vice president of a gang, those guys had to be brutal because they had to demand respect and they did it through fear. Now I didn't have that kind of heart, but I did have a survival heart. I was out to survive. So I had to join the gang and be as bad as they were because, you know, in order for them to respect you, you had to make sure. But when they had these initiations, and I remember this, guy came from, his whole family came from Colombia, and, and when they see new people come into the neighborhood, you know, it was like fresh meat, you know, they had to sort of show or prove themselves, you're going to be in this gang, or you can't roam around the neighborhood, because everybody wanted to be in gangs, you know, and it troubled me when, you know, the president said, well, we have to sort of initiate this guy, because he's coming into the neighborhood. I had a close friend of mine who didn't have to join the gang because he was a very close friend of mine. His mother would have killed him if he would have joined the gang. So I sort of covered him because he was, he knew me. But this other guy who just came into the neighborhood and they started to reach and tell him you need to join the gang because they didn't know he had a lot of sisters and he, they would get harassed. So I had to sort of find out, I gotta make this quick, these stories, man, sorry. But uh, I had to sort of Make sure when I see the rituals of them doing the initiation, it bothered me. So I had to find a way to intercede, intervene, so that he wouldn't get the full brunt of his initiation. So I had to really get really mean and nasty and ugly with those guys in the gang so that they knew that I'm in business. So that this guy didn't have to go through it. There were choices that we have to make sometimes in living these lives or personalities in order to survive. And I've always been a, a survivor. And I had to do things, although what was happening inside of me was not, you know, to be brutal. So I got caught up in sports, as you know, and the second part of the story is that growing up, I was an incredible athlete. So I played sports and in every team that I played on, every team that I played on, 
I sort of came out with trophies. I was always an MVP player, even in high, junior high, high school, I was all, all city three years in a row, and, and all these things were there, but I was usually playing because I was a survivor. It was all about me. I liked the idea of trying to get the team. Every team I played for, whether they went every time to the playoffs or to the championship, I never won a championship. Ever. I had an opportunity in high school to win the, our division completely. We had some amazing players. Now, mind you, I used to come out of these things as three trophies at a time, our MVP for having the most of this. And so I had trophies. I had to get rid of all these trophies. I couldn't carry them everywhere I went. But when I thought about the, what we was driving me was trying to get the team to sort of make it up there. And it said, I always fell short of trying to do that. And in high school, I remember I had, there were like four players that had scholarships, including myself. And in the last couple of games that we had to win the last game in order to make it to be re regional winners in high school. The last game, three, two, or three of our players, three of those main players drop out of school. The chances, well, no, one got killed. One got killed. Young kid. Sisters were you know, involved with drug dealers, and the other two just dropped out of school. One of those guys I led to the Lord many years later, while we played football, but never won a championship because, for whatever reason, I'm on a championship team now. See, we are not a championship team, right. we already won. Amen. We have the victory already. Amen. The difference now is, is working toward a goal together. Why well, I didn't win before? Because at that point I couldn't see these things before. And God's saying, you know, honesty and integrity. I always value those things. Those things are important. Now I'm going to read you a story of what it is. And if you have your Bibles, go to 1 Samuel, chapter 20. I'm going to show you a man, men of integrity. 1 Samuel chapter 20. We're going to start with verse chapter, uh, verse maybe 2. Now remember that, you know, some of you might know this particular story. It says, Jonathan answered, um, and this is what's happening here in an agreement between Jonathan and Jonathan was King Saul's uh, son, and David was the king to be. Uh, so here in verse uh, 20, verse 2. Jonathan answers David. He says, uh, David, let me go to verse 1. David ran away from the camp as Arama, and he went to Jonathan and asked him, uh, what have I done wrong? What is uh, my crime? Why is your father trying to kill me? Verse 2, Jonathan answers him, uh, that can't be true. My father isn't trying to kill you. My father doesn't do anything without first telling me. It, it doesn't matter how important it is. Uh, my father always tells me. And he says, why would my father refuse to tell me that he wants to kill you? No, it, it is not true. This is Jonathan. But David answers, your father knows very well that I am your friend. Your father said to, to himself, Jonathan must not know about it. If he knows, he will tell David. But as surely as you and the Lord are alive, I am very close to death. What is John, David trying to tell Jonathan? Your father's out to get me. Jonathan can't seem to believe it because he said tell him everything. Here goes Jonathan, verse 4. Jonathan says to David, I will do anything you want me to do. Then David said, look, tomorrow is the new moon. The new moon celebration. I am supposed to eat and with the king, but let me uh, first, you know, celebrate my, I'm going to first, it says, let me uh, hide in the fields until evening. If your father notices that I am gone, tell him, 
David wanted to go home to Bethlehem and to his family where his father was going to hold a monthly feast and sacrifice. And David asked me to let him run down to Bethlehem for sacrifice. And David asked me with, uh, to let him go down. So, and then goes verse 7. If your father says fine, then I am safe. But if your father becomes angry with uh, angry, you will know uh, uh, that he wants to hurt me. Verse 8, Jonathan, be, uh, Jonathan says, uh, be kind to me. I am your servant. You have made an agreement with me before the Lord. If I am guilty, you may kill me yourself. But don't take me uh, to your father. And Jonathan, verse 9, says, answers, no, never. Uh, if I learn that my father uh, plans to hurt you, I will uh, warn you. And he didn't work out a plan of how he's going to warn him. And he says there in verse 11, Then Jonathan will, get, will come. Let, let us go out into the field. So Jonathan and David went up together to the field. Verse 12, Jonathan said, David, I make this promise before the Lord, the God of Israel. I promise that I will learn how, learn uh, whether his father is really trying to kill him or not. Verse 13, if my father wants to hurt you, I will let you know. I will let you know and let you leave in safety. May the Lord punish me if I don't do this. May the Lord be with you as he has been with my father. As long as I live, show me the same kindness uh, to my family. Be faithful to us even when the Lord uh, destroys all your enemies. And this is Jonathan telling David. You follow so far? Yes. Verse 17, Jonathan says, uh, Jonathan loved for David as, as himself. And because of this love, he asked David to repeat this agreement. So let me hear this again. Let me make sure we got this right. So Jonathan says to David, he says the same thing. They go through it. And on the third day, go to the same place. So they tell him that what he needs to do if he's following the turn. Now, the feast comes, and I'm going to go to the verse there. I think it's better for me to read it than trying to elaborate on this thing. Uh, he tells they work out a plan all the way to verse 22 of how to turn, determine how you know, he would know whether his father is trying to kill him or not and the signal for David to get away. But uh, verse 22 says, But if there is trouble, I will say to the boy, You must leave and the Lord is sending you away. Remember that the agreement between you and me, the Lord is our witness forever. Then David hid in the field. Saul's attitude in the celebration. So the time for the new moon was there, celebration, and king uh, sat down to eat and he sat next to and he, and he came down and he asked, uh, but David's place was empty and that Saul at this point said, uh, on verse 27, on the next day, the second day of the month, David's place was empty again. And then Saul said to his son, Jonathan, why didn't Jesse's son come to the new moon celebration yesterday or today? And here, uh, he starts to, Jonathan answers him, well, David asked me uh, as they planned, uh, to go to Bethlehem. Uh, he said that uh, they let me go and our families are having a sacrifice in Bethlehem. My brothers ordered uh, me to be uh, there. Now, if I am your friend, please let me go and see my brothers. That is why David has not come to the king's table. Verse 30, Saul was very angry with Jonathan and said to him, you son of a twisted, rebellious woman. <laughs> <laughs> Five words, right? I know that you have chosen to support the son of Jesse. It will bring shame to you and your mother. As long as Jesse's son lives, you will never be king and have a kingdom. Now, bring David to me. He, he is dead. He's a dead man. And Jonathan asked his father, why should David be killed? What did he do wrong? But so threw the spear at, his, at Jonathan and tried to kill him. So Jonathan knew that his father wanted very much to kill David. Jonathan became angry and left the table. These two were men, as you know, men of integrity. Jonathan never left his dad. He served with him to his death. But he also helped David get away. And if you were to read when you have a chance, 2 Samuel, chapter 23, chapter 22, 20, uh, I'm sorry, not 23, I think you need to go 2 Samuel, chapter 4. 
Because there you will find that after the death of King Saul and Jonathan, the agreement that David wanted to keep his agreement <coughs> with the promise he made Jonathan. And there was such chaos that when, as soon as they died, you know, it's, it's a process you have to go through. Generals are still fighting, you know, they want to try to get David to the kingdom so he can get anointed to be king. And things are happening. And it so happens that one of the, the his generals ends up killing Jonathan's family behind David's back. And all this thing happens and David feels, and that's why he says, man, he, he was not a happy camper because he wanted to keep his word. He wanted to be a, an honest man, a man of integrity. He wanted to fulfill his commitment with his brother in the Lord. And so often there are things in life that causes us not to fulfill our commitment. When Jesus turned to the people and said, pure heart, he says, I need you to be honest. Now I say that we're going to be perfect. He says that so often honesty and as you look at integrity, work together. The Bible tells us specifically that we need to endure and persevere through a lot of our challenges because that builds character and ultimately integrity. And so often we take the little lies because David and all these things, they conspire something against the king. They little lie. Almost like when David had to run for his life with King Saul, the first thing he does after he leaves there, you continue the story, David goes, runs away, he has no money, he has no weapons. He has nothing as he runs away. So the first place he goes is to where? Anybody knows where he goes? He goes to the temple because he needs to get food. And, he, and look at what he starts to say to the priest that comes out to him. There's nothing honest about what he's saying. Because the priest says, the priest is afraid. He says, David, why are you here? And he tells him, um, and the priest says, where, where are your men? David doesn't tell them the truth. He says they're hiding. Give me something to eat. I'll give my men something to eat. And so the priest says, the only thing I have is food that goes to the priest. And these men that I'm going to give this food to, they cannot have be married or have women. He takes the food because if he doesn't take it, what's going to happen? He'll die. So he tells them, oh, by the way, do you have um, any weapons in there? He says, this is a temple. We don't carry weapons. Oh, by the way, but we do have one. <coughs> and the only weapon in that temple was the sword that David used to kill Goliath. God always makes a way. But he is not saying that God's approving of our little 